What is actually going on at all these college protests that are taking place across the country? Obviously, one of the biggest ones that's gotten the most attention has been Colombia, and there's been some interesting things going on there. But that's not the only place to include some false reports coming out of Texas that the National Guard was called in. Spoiler alert, that didn't actually happen. But here's what we're going to go over today. We're going to ask the question, what are they actually protesting about? Because all of us have an idea of what we think they want. But if you start to look at the list of demands from various protests, it can vary greatly. So we're going to look at what do they actually want? What do we think is really fueling this? And one of the most important things we're going to discuss today is in a world where we're having politicians talking about forgiving billions of dollars in student loans, I think we as taxpayers have a right to ask the question, is this the sort of thing we want to be funding? whether it's in government subsidies, whether it's in forgiving of loans that the taxpayers backed, is this the sort of thing that we want to be subsidizing? And if it is, is it, is it fair enough to say, fine, if you want that sort of experience, you pay for it, but you don't get to require the taxpayers to do it? Because once you start to learn what sort of endowments these universities are sitting on, combined with how much of your tax dollars they're getting, you're probably going to be a little bit frustrated. All that and more coming up on this episode of Making the Argument, brought to you by Good Ranchers, our good buddy, Nicholas Hamilton, producer of Producers, is not in the studio today. Uh, but he would, of course, like to encourage all of you to make sure that you go over to our Circle Chat. That's our online community where we get a lot of ideas for the episodes that we have, as well as discuss a lot of other issues. There's also going to be some exciting, ex- exciting. There's going to be some exciting things coming on uh, this year with uh, expanding out that community and actually providing probably some uh, community-only content. So. Go ahead and over to Circle right there on the show notes page. You can look up, sign up for that. It's a good time. As always, I'm your host, Nick Freitas. With us in the studio, my beautiful bride, Tina, queen of the bees. Hello, everyone. And then, of course, we have our resident historian and political prognosticator, Christian Hines. How are you, Master Hines? I'm doing well. And as I said, Nicholas Hamilton, the good Hamilton, the one that doesn't like central banking, not here today, but that's okay. He will be in later. And uh, and I don't know, maybe, maybe we'll get him at the tail end of this. But here's what we want to discuss today. Um, again, I I think when most people hear protests on a college campus, it's like, Oh, Tuesday already. (laughs) Like like this is just something that they do. But again, we're not talking about a protest where a bunch of students rally for a day to talk about a particular issue. No, we're talking about encampments that are being set up in a semi-permanent fashion, um, which go way outside the the boundaries for what an, an, an institution can really cope with. Uh, we're not talking about people that just want to, you know, do a protest and have their voices heard and maybe discuss issues. We're talking about people getting out there and saying some, let's just say offering up some pretty violent solutions for what they would like to see happening, uh, doing the typical demands. And can, can I just, can I just say this as a taxpaying citizen? Um, I, I've gotten a little bit frustrated with the, uh, with the super arrogant college student that, has essentially done nothing at this point in their life. They've graduated from high school. They've made it into college. Standing around demanding things. I demand that you... Shut up. Like, I'm sorry, not to be a jerk. I understand that people get passionate, but I really, I am so done with, with the, the entitled college student believing that because they took an introductory class in anthropology, they understand all the complexities of the wars going on in the Middle East. Like seriously, we demand, don't care. And, and this is the part that I think a lot of us have been wondering is when are universities going to start saying, eh, yeah, we don't care. We don't, we don't care what you want. Uh, you can either show up to class, right? You can show up to class or, or you can leave, but you don't get to set up your, you don't get to set up your little encampment in, in a space that you don't own. That's not your property. Well, there have been some strongly worded uh, statements and, and we all know how strongly worded statements are so helpful to the situation. Yeah. Um, it, it is kind of funny because uh, now there's all this speculation that, oh, these poor students might have this record follow them <laughs> yeah. into their career. Boo-hoo. Yeah. yeah. Well, so let's, let's, talk, let's talk first. We're going to go to, I'm going to go in an article here from CNN, right? So it's not exactly, I'm not, I'm not going to some sort of, you know, right wing place to get this. So um, here, here's the question on why do they say they're protesting? Why do they say they're protesting, right? So college campuses across the United States have erupted with pro-Palestinian protests and school administrators are trying and largely failing to defuse the situation. Tensions on U.S. college campuses have risen since Hamas's October 7th attack when militants killed about 1,200 people and took more than 200 hostages. Just to give you an idea, right, for, for population comparison, 
If something of similar size happened in the United States, it would mean roughly about 30 to 5, 35 to 40,000 Americans would have been killed and thousands of them would have been held hostage. So to give you, give you an idea, that's, that's kind of the, um, the, the population equivalent if it had happened in the United States. Israel's retaliatory assault on Gaza has killed more than 34,000 people, according to its health ministry. Anybody want to guess who runs the health ministry in Gaza? Hamas. Right. This is one thing that I look at CNN and, and it's like you guys are you guys are just mm-hmm. jokes as as a journalist. I was reading I was reading an article that I'm sure was put out by the AP and then uh, CNN, you know, recycled. But uh, it everything they described with what happened in Gaza was super minimized. And then they they were really, really extra. uh I guess you would you would say um, lenient on the the figures coming from Hamas and yeah. and they were they painted with this brush of oh these poor people are being pushed into um, you know pushed back and and all this famine is now happening and and they're cut off and and they've killed thirty some odd thousand you know people well, they, and people p- babies are dying and people are starving well the, the thing but is they I don't, don't talk about like why this happened. No, no, I, I don't doubt. I don't doubt that civilians have been killed in Gaza. I don't, I don't doubt that, that, that it is a very, very unfortunate byproduct of, of combat operations. Um, but, but here's what I have a problem with. It's this idea that when Hamas says 34,000 people have been killed, mostly women and children and CNN and the AP and everyone else just do it. Oh yeah. yeah I, I, I guess that's what happened. Really? Okay, do you have, well, well, yeah, this is according to Hamas. So it's according to Hamas. So Hamas is giving you these numbers, and there's just no skepticism about that whatsoever. But look, we're, we're going to get onto that later. Reports of anti-Semitic acts have surged across America, particularly on campuses since October 7th. Islamophobia has run rampant too, right? We, gotta, we always got to make sure that it's, hey, it's, it's both sides. Both sides are bad. Both sides are guilty. The recent surge in protests have inflamed those tensions, forcing leadership to decide when free speech on campus crosses a line and becomes threatening. Several schools have called the police on protesters, leading to the arrests of hundreds across multiple campuses. So the whole idea of, um, you know, what, what is this about? Okay, this is, again, students protesting in favor of Palestine. Now, let's keep in mind some of the things that are actually being said um, and some of the things that are being demanded. So one of the things that are, is typically demanded is they, requ- they uh, demand that the university divest, which means basically pulls all, pull all of your investments. A lot of that has to do sometimes within retirement accounts. Most of these universities, especially ones like Columbia, they are sitting on you know, billions of dollars worth of endowments, right? And, and one of the ways that they fund their operating costs is they have these endowments, they use these endowments, they're invested in various things, which you know, gives them revenue to, to operate. So they're saying, okay, fine, you got to take all of, your, all of the money that you have control over and you got to divest out of anything you know, in Israel. You got to divest out of anything within the arms industry. You got to divest, you, know, you, we, you, you must put out a resolution. And here's how stupid this gets. There was actually a school board in Southern California where a bunch of pro-Palestinian protests showed up demanding that the school board in Southern California do a, a resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. Oh, and then they got a big win and they were cheering when, when they put, put out the resolution, right? No. In, in fact, in this one, I got to give it to the head of the school board. Um, she immediately stopped them and said, this falls nowhere within our purview. And, and so oh, we're not good. going to discuss it. Um, but no, this, this is the sort of thing you're saying. These are, these are kind of like the demands, right? Yeah. But, but doesn't it seem to you like these demands didn't immediately come out? They started these protests. They started to try to occupy these ca- campuses and do basically where they're living in tents on the campus. Um, they're taking things over like it's the Chaz or something. And, um, and then all of a sudden somebody's like, hey, you know, we should probably have some demands because they're, they're asking what's, what it's going to take for us to leave. And we can't, can't necessarily say we're going to do this till the war ends. So we're going to have to come up with some other demands. Yeah. It, that's how it seems like they did this because the demands didn't come out. They're kind of hard to find. They didn't come out right away. And it's, it's like somebody was like, wait a minute, we got to look a little bit legit here. Let's go ahead and have a conversation about this. Well, and, and, but they can't even agree on what they want. I mean, they want div- them to divest, but they they also want the schools to cut all ties with any company that does business with Israel as well. So it like cutting ties completely. I mean, 
it's a lot. No, it, it, it is. And like I said, so the, the, the encampments, this is the one on Columbia, were organized by Columbia University Apartheid Divest, right? A student-led coalition of more than 100 organizations, including Students for Justice in Palestine, Jewish Voice for Peace, to protest what they describe as the university's continued financial investment in corporations that profit from Israeli apartheid, genocide, and military occupation of Palestine. So, so much of this stuff gives it away um, when you talk about that. First of all, I, I, I am sorry. And, I'm, and, and, you know, we had a delegate in Virginia repeat this, what I think is nonsense, this idea of that there is a genocide going on in Gaza. No, there is not. I'm sorry. Genocide actually has a definition. That is not what is going on. They have this idea that, well, Israel has completely sealed off all of Gaza. No, it has not. Gaza has a border with Egypt. Well, it, Israel has occupied Gaza. It has, it has gone into Gaza after Hamas launched a massive attack into Israel. So. Turns out, pro, student protesters, turns out that's what happens. It, if, you, if you commit a bunch of horrible acts of murder and terrorism, there is most likely going to be a military and or law enforcement response. And, and so you got a military response. That, that's what happened. You know, it's not like Israel woke up on October 8th and said, you know what, we're just, we're just tired of this. We're, we're just we're, going to attack. We're just going to attack because we're mean. They, Israel, the, the Israeli troops, Israeli law enforcement, the Israeli government was not in Gaza. After two, they pulled out in 2005. So they weren't occupying it 2005, since 2005. Now, their, their statement is, is, oh, but they've sealed off Gaza. No, they haven't. They can't. Gaza shares a border with Egypt. Well, but they've, they've sealed off the border between Gaza and Israel. Uh, yeah. yeah, probably, probably, just going to throw this out there, might have something to do with the fact that Hamas likes to kill Israelis. You know how I know this? Because even before October 7th, Hamas, in its charter, talks about killing Jews and destroying the Israeli state, and they've done it for decades. So I, I, got, a, I got a question to all you brilliant student protesters out there. Let's say somebody invaded your home, right? Let's say that somebody did that, right? There's a border. There's a wall between you and your neighbor, and your neighbor kept coming over, right, and, and stealing your stuff killing your dog, right? Whatever it was, stealing your, your, your Amazon packages. I, I really want to hit these student protesters in, in an area where I know they'll feel it, right? I want you to imagine your neighbor stealing your Amazon packages, right? Now we're talking about a, a high level of just atrocity, okay? Chances are, at some point, you would want to secure that little position between you and your neighbor, right? So yes, you don't, you don't get an open border if you constantly cross that border to murder your neighbors, well, it seems like, you know, you said Israel didn't just wake up one day and go, I'm going to attack Hamas, okay? But it kind of seems like maybe uh, the response would have been exactly the same if they had done that. So if they just would have woken up the day before the October uh, attack happened um, and just decided to attack Hamas that day, yeah. you know, perhaps they, they would be receiving the same level of anger as if the attack, whether it happened or not, yeah. Well, I mean, that's what they did in the Six Day War, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, the, well, even in the Six Day in, in the Six Day War, um, so for those those of you who are not uh, aware, in the, the Six Day War, which happened in six, 1967, um, the Israelis actually launched the strike first. But the reason why they did it was because um, Nasser of Egypt, who was in close uh, cooperation with uh, the Syrians and Jor the Jordanians, and, and, and to some degree the Lebanese. So you got to figure every country which bordered Israel. Um, was, was, you know, was threatening to invade and destroy Israel. And basically, they, they kept saber-rattling as if it was imminent, as if they could attack at any time. And so the Israelis at some point said, well, we're not going to just sit here and wait to be attacked because at that point, I mean, when, when the narrowest part of your country is like 12 miles, if every single one of your neighbors, all of whom possess militaries theoretically bigger than yours, maybe with the exception of Jordan, um, okay, if, if they decide to attack and you're not ready for it, you're you're gonna lose, and so they they launched a preemptive strike in uh, 1967, essentially wiped out the the Egyptian and Syrian air force like on the ground, um, and then just proceeded to devastate uh, their respective militaries. That's where Israel got the Golan Heights. It's where the Isra it's where Israel originally got the Sinai, um, and then I want to believe the West Bank as well. That's where they got the West Bank. But I think I'm trying to remember if they um, if they went into the West Bank initially or if they went in after Jordan 
I can't remember because so, there, so there was what happened a, was is that yeah. on on the first day of the war yeah. the Israelis wiped out the Egyptian air force and the Jordanians had not yet entered the war because yeah. they were not like part or they weren't allied with e Egypt to the degree no. that Syria was. Syria was literally a At part they of were the Egypt same country. not yeah. that long before. They were the United Arab Republic. But um so it was inevitable that Syria was going to come in on, on this and Israel was going to have to fight on two fronts. They didn't want to fight on three fronts. So the Israelis yeah. reached out to the Jordanians and offered a truce. And the king of Jordan replied with, well, the die has been cast. Yeah. And that's and, when they lost the West Bank. So yeah. the reason why we're bringing up this little history lesson here is because, again, when they talk about the occupied territories, um, they're usually talking about the West Bank. Um, and Gaza. The, and Gaza. But Gaza and, hasn't and been. somewhat the Golan Heights. Yeah. Yeah. Go, yeah. Definitely the Golan Heights, especially if you're talking about the Syrians. But. Um, because the Golan Heights were, were part of Syria. The, the, basically, Israel kept the Golan Heights after 67 because it, it's the heights. Or it's, a, it's, a, it's a piece of high ground that overlooks um, uh, the valley in, in uh, Israel. And so they, they basically kept it as a defensive measure against Syrian invasion. Uh, the West Bank obviously was historically a part of historical Israel. And then uh, Gaza to a lesser extent. But again, they didn't really... They stopped. They 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 removed all um, Israeli forces from Gaza back in 2005. Yeah, and so and I I think what's important to understand here is when they talk about you know again why are they doing this w when they talk about oh we want to free Palestine we want to end the occupation of Palestine they're not even talking about going back to pre 1967 numbers when when student protesters shout out from the river to the sea Palestine will be free that is the River Jordan to the Mediterranean you. Anybody want to take a guess at what sits in between the River Jordan Israel. and the Mediterranean? Israel. And so there, there's been some people, there's been this, this big dust off. Is it anti-Semitic to say from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free? Now, some people will say, well, no, it's just basically a political statement about the state of Israel. Okay, f f can, can someone imagine a scenario where that is genuinely what somebody believes. It's like, I have no problem with the Jewish people. I just don't think the Israeli, I don't think the Israeli state is legitimate. Okay, let's, let's, let's be generous and assume that's exactly where they're coming from. The big question that this would, you know, demand such a person to answer is, okay, what do you do with the Israeli state? If you mean, if you really mean that, that you think the entire Israeli state is a, is a rogue state, right, is an illegitimate country, then, then what do you do? And what do you think happens to all the Jewish people living in that area? And I think the answer you get from most of these people is they don't care. They don't care. Or they'll say, well, you can live under a newly established Palestinian state. Oh, I'm sure that would work out amazingly well for Jewish people because it's worked out well for all the Jewish people living in all of the Arab states in that region. Oh, wait. No, it hasn't. There was this famous speech that an ambassador to the United Nations from Israel gave where he said, where are your Jews? And he started listening up. This is how many Jews used to live in Iraq. This is how many Jews used to live in Saudi Arabia. This is how many Jews used to live in Egypt. Why aren't they there anymore? Some of them immigrated. Some of them were butchered. Right? But you, you don't have much of a Jewish population in, in the rest of the Middle East. So anyways, that's why we just give that quick. When they say occupied territories or occupied Palestine, they, they essentially mean ending Israel. That's what they mean. You also kind of have to go back and go, okay, so how far back in history are we going to go here? Because um, there is this sentiment that if these people used to occupy this land and the new people come in and push them off that land, then the people pushed off the land can commit absolute atrocities on the people that pushed them off because um, it's warranted, like it's justified. Um, so, I mean, some of these college students um, somewhere along the line were talking about how, oh, yeah, Native Americans totally have a right to come into people's homes and, like, slaughter their families because they took their land. And even though it happened ages ago. Well, and, the, and we're not going to talk about whose land it was before them, right? Yeah. And, and so that's kind of the question is, how, fa how far back are we going to really go well, and here it, and it's always, it's always to just... establish whether it's an, a legitimate they always want to Claim. go just far back enough to achieve their own political objectives and no more, right? Mm -hmm. Because if, if they really wanted to talk, they're, it, what they're talking about is, is Arabs in this area. They say Palestinians. Okay, Palestinian is a, is a, it, it's a legal term with respect to, again, the, the Romans were the first one to actually give, to, to name the region Palestine, and they actually did it as an insult to the Jews 
when they sacked Jerusalem in what, 70 AD? Uh, was no, the second hey, or? It, I believe this was Hadrian. I mean, there were multiple Jewish revolts against there the There was Romans, multiple Jewish revolts. Hadrian it was, was after the one Hadrian. That, Hadrian was the one that came in and just like, you want to talk about actual attempts at genocide. Hadrian was trying to genocide the Jews because the province was actually called Judea and had been called Judea for since the Bronze Age. Um, even though it hadn't always been under Jewish rule, right? So you had, again, you go back far enough, you have the Canaanites, various Canaanite tribes, Amorites, Philistines, stuff like that. Then you have the Jewish kingdoms. Then you have the Assyrians taking out the Northern kingdom. Then you have the Babylonians taking out the Southern one. Then you have the Persian kingdoms. Then you have, you know, the, 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 Ro the Romans, the Byzantines. It's not until the Byzantine empire that the Arabs actually come in and, and control portions of this, this area. With the Abbasid Caliphate. Ripped Heraclius. Yeah. So so this idea. <laughs> yeah. So this idea that so okay, how far back do you want to go? Because the, the you, Arabs You, you want to go not... back, Nick? The answer to the question is simple. You were allowed to adopt blood and soil <laughs> arguments under two conditions. Yeah. One, the group of people that are allowed to argue for blood and soil cannot be white. Yeah. And two, you are not allowed to argue for blood and soil pre six forty <laughs> AD. Yeah. Yeah. Um, those are, those are the two conditions. If you can meet those two conditions, if your people group is not white yeah. and if you're talking post 640 AD, yeah. then you are allowed to use blood you and soil want, all day long. <laughs> well, here's the question. So is this nonsense just going on in Col at Columbia university in New York? No, we know it's going out of the places. What are some of the places? All right. So where else is this happening? Well, since last Tuesday, this is a, again, a slightly older article from CNN. Pro-Palestinian encampment, encampments have been set up at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, Emerson, the University of Texas at Austin, the University of Michigan, the University of California, Berkeley. What a shocker. On Wednesday, police arrested nearly 100 protesters at the University of Southern California after a dispos dispersal order. Yale University police arrested at least 45 protesters Monday and charged them with criminal trespassing after they refused orders to leave, though dozens of protesters remained uh, Tuesday morning. Harvard University closed Harvard Yard and officials at the school suspended a pro-Palestinian student organization for allegedly violating school policies. Meanwhile, nine people were arrested Tuesday at University of Minnesota's Twin Cities campus after they formed an encampment that went against school policy. Students, faculty, and staff at the University of New Mexico peacefully protested Monday in support of Gaza, the university said in a statement Tuesday, and more than 100 people were arrested Wednesday at Emerson College in Boston, shocker, during a pro-Palestinian protest, according to the Boston Police Department. It's also important to note there was a lot of people on, on Twitter and whatnot talking about how, oh, the National Guard have been called in to University of Texas, Austin. I can't believe this. This is Kent State all over again. Yeah, it wasn't the National Guard. It was Virginia State Police. Or, excuse me, not Virginia. It was uh, Texas State Police. Um. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so, so this is, this is going on college campuses, um, all over the place. Um, now here's, here's something that I, I think, and, and again, the, the way this is being dealt with, I'm actually surprised Columbia. I'm, I'm not as surprised. They, they finally called police to try to remove trespassers, but they're negotiating with these groups as if they're, uh, as if these are like foreign countries as if they're and, and legitimate establishing peace treaties with one another. This um, is also um, happening some semi across the whole Western world. You've got it happening in Canada. You've got it happening in um, Europe, England, uh, France. You know, so you've got you've got these kind of things happening all over the place. It's kind of an academia problem. You know where it's not happening? Japan. <laughs> Yeah, Japan is not having a huge problem yeah. with what does Japan care? Over gas. Yeah. <laughs> it's not happening in South Korea or Taiwan either. Yeah. And the reason why is because those places recognize that you know what? When you act like total barbarians, we're not gonna hold a bunch of protests and rallies. But you know what? I'm kind of getting ahead of myself because the the same reason that you don't see these like pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas protests in a country like Japan is actually part of the reason why the protests are actually taking place. So I might want to hold that off until later in the episode. Yeah. I mean, it, again, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised. Like USC canceled their commencement address. Um, again, state troopers were called into Austin. You know, th this is not just happening. At, um, this is not just happening at uh, universities though. Like you have people blocking traffic. Um, Google, Google was an interesting story. Um, let me pull this up here real quick. So Google fires more workers over. And I love this headline. Where is this from? USA Today. Um, Google fires more workers over pro-Palestinian protests held at offices, cites disruption. Yeah, they were basically protesting, like, 
it's not like they were sitting outside on the grass at Google protest, which in and of itself, if Google didn't want them to, it's like, this is private property. Move along. No, they were like she going into offices <laughs> and protesting in the middle of the workday. And you've got like Google executives and, and supervisors going and going like, hey, guys, we understand where you're coming from. And, you know, we've tried to give you an opportunity to have your voices be heard, but we really do need to work. And it's like, no, we demand the go shut. You're fired. You're fired. You're fired. Goodbye. You're fired. Goodbye. Google actually has been firing people, but a, a part of me too has a, has a, I, I struggle with this and, uh, and I had someone kind of lecture me on it once before and I get it. And it was a while back when Anna Kasparian was getting all upset about something. I was like, oh, is, is Anna Kasparian dealing with the consequences of her actions? <laughs> and it, it's, I look at Google, it's like, yeah, you encourage this, you encourage this culture. And now it's coming back to bite you and you're firing people and, and the press isn't being nice to you. Okay. Maybe you should keep this in mind the next time you engage in the sort of statements that you do in the sort of culture that you attempt to create and the sort of activism you participate in as a company. Oh, yeah. I mean, just do a Google search. What was it the other day, Nick? You were talk you were searching something about, I think, the Columbia uh, protests or something yeah. on Google. And it the the search results from there versus different search engines oh. was Crazy different. I mean, just as I was, as I was researching for this, I had to continually go over to duck, duck, go and do, and put in the exact same search request. And I would get very different results, except they were the results I was looking for, not the results Google had curated in order to influence my opinion on this topic. We are not sponsored by duck, duck, go either. No, no yeah. <laughs> and duck, duck, duck gives us no money or support or anything like that. But it's one of those things where, and again, I don't even know what duck, duck goes political ideology is on anything. I think they're just trying to come up with, you know, a, a search algorithm that makes sense based off of your request. Whereas I've noticed with Google more and more, and it's, I think it's become more blatant recently where yeah. you will, you will type in something. You have to and go to page you, six to find what you you're looking for. 12 articles trying to refute what it was that you were asking yep. for. It's like, look, just give me the data I'm looking for, not all of these liberal organizations analysis of the data I'm looking for. And that's why I look at organizations like Google, like, yes, this is, I sure hope you are finally making a connection to the way you behave and the sort of behavior you encourage, right? And the pain you are currently feeling, because if you never make that connection, you're just going to repeat it again and wonder why this is going on. Haven't we been so nice and tolerant and understanding? Yes, you've been nice and tolerant with understanding with people who don't care if you're nice or tolerant and understanding. Right. They want something and they're determined to get it. And they will be more than happy to abuse whatever tolerance that you show them in order to get what they want. But you know who will not do that to you? You know who will not treat you with that sort of contempt? Good ranchers. Good ranchers won't. Good ranchers has got your back. In fact, I think a problem with a lot of these protesters is they're probably just lacking protein and testosterone. But the point is, is that if you actually want to be able to have the sort of environment where you can sit down with other people and have a conversation... You can come to the table, you can sit down, you discuss your day, you can discuss important issues. So much of that goes so much better if you're breaking bread with one another. And Good Ranchers has made that a part of their mission. Plus, if you go to goodranchers.com and you put in promo code Nick, you're going to get the benefit of their price shield if you sign up for one of their subscriptions. So not only are you going to get a whole bunch of other deals associated with that, but you can get locked into the price today and keep that price for your subscription all the way to 2026. With everything the Federal Reserve and the federal government has been doing, that is a really, really good idea. I cannot imagine their CFO is happy about that. In fact, I talked to Ben Spell. He told me he's not happy. Their CFO is not happy about that. But they're willing to do it because they want to make sure that they're providing you a good product delivered to your door at a good price. So go to GoodRanchers.com, put in promo code Nick, take advantage of that price shield now. Okay. You were mentioning um, just before you did that amazing ad transition, <laughs> you were talking about kind of Google's getting what they get, kind of. You created this. Uh, now you're going to have to contend with the results of what you created. And I feel the same way about these universities because uh, I hate to say it, and I'm going to just say it because who knows, maybe I'll get quoted and people will think I'm crazy, but... <laughs> Honestly, I'm kind of glad that this is happening to academia right now. I'm kind of glad. Like, I, I, I am glad people are kind of feeling the hurt of not getting the education that they paid for. And um, 
and taking it out on these colleges and universities. I'm glad that their reputations are getting soiled with all of this stuff that they created. Like, it's out in the open now. And and it's interesting to me because I feel like um, they've done a really good job packaging your college experience and selling it to you for insane amounts of money and making you think that all this crazy stuff, that's just right-wing rhetoric. That's just propaganda from the right wing. Well, now we're actually seeing it happen on their campuses. Students are feeling unsafe going in. They're having to cancel classes, cancel commencement addresses. They're canceling all of these. For the rest of of the um, semester, classes are canceled at some of these places. And you know what? I'm kind of glad because they haven't been giving the students what they're paying for anyway for a really long time. They've been feeding these students crappy, you know, garbage um, degree um, degree programs and and racking up all this student loan debt. And now they're a barista at Starbucks. And, you know, enough is enough on that. And I'm just kind of glad that it's out in the open now and people are sort of seeing it for what it really is. What? So I sent a meme. I, I I have to pull this up now because I think Tina saw it. Um, Did I? Where is it? Oh, here's the. Here, oh, hang on, hang on. I uh, um, here's the uh, here's the meme. I I want y'all's take on this. Um, explain oh, it for those who are uh-oh. okay. You know, here I I'll just pull it directly from the source if you give yeah, me a explain second. Explain it. Um. For for the audio, especially because I'll I'll get on. I'll be able to give credit. Um, Orrin McIntyre, his Twitter feed is just hilarious. Sometimes he tweeted this recently after um an American flag at Harvard University was replaced with a Palestinian flag. Here's the video of that, right? And yeah. and and you know the students are chanting about globalize the antifada, and he tweeted this, and he said, "I want tanks in Harvard Yard." It, it's it's the Star Wars meme, and Leia's yeah. responding because of the Palestinian protesters, <laughs> and then it's just Anakin yeah. silent, and she's like, "Because the Palestinian protesters, yeah. right?" Yeah. <laughs> He's been tweeting lately. Look, I don't care what the stated justification is. If if we can get tanks in Harvard Yard, I'll I'll deal with whatever the justification is. <laughs> his his thought process goes something like this: It's universities have been a hotbed of of pushing radical left-wing policies, not yeah. even liberal at this point, just straight up cultural Marxism, socialism. Yeah, well, and, and let's, and before we go on, because I want to do that, let's distinguish real quick between, again, how we distinguish between leftism and liberalism, right? L- liberalism still buys into this idea that the scientific method, that logic, that critical thinking, um, you know, in, inductive argument, deductive arguments, like we're going to stack up all the evidence, we're going to try to come up with, you know, some, that's fine. Like we don't have any problem with that leftism is something very different. So sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, 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 that, I, I, that's fine. And in fact, I think that one of the, the problems is that, and, and this is actually getting back to Tina's point, a potential good that could come out of all of this chaos is that universities, and we've talked about this at length, universities for a long time have been a hotbed of, of basically generating, creating Marxists, right? Like, you go to a university and you spend four years being indoctrinated, being, you know, being told a lie. Yeah. And, and what's happened is, is that the same people that the universities have been creating for all of this time have now turned around and have started attacking the universities themselves. What it is, is it's, it's the Leviathan eating itself. Yeah. And, and that, that's the incredible thing about all of this. We are so, we are so used to seeing the board of directors at Disney, the editorial staff at the New York Times, and the faculty at Columbia all agree on the same thing. Yeah. They're all on the same page 99% of the time. And we are now seeing something where they're not on the same page. In fact, they're fighting each other. The same students that Columbia is producing and have been producing for, for decades now have now turned around and they're not attacking conservatives. They're attacking the university at Columbia, they're yeah. attacking the faculty, they're attacking the, they're attacking the board, they're attacking other students. And, and we can condemn this and say, well, I mean, them resorting to violence and intimidation and stuff like that, that's all bad. I understand all of that and I, I'm totally on board with, I'm totally on board with condemning these people. Anybody that's going out there, you know, cheering on globalize the Antifada and Hamas are the good guys. No, th- those people are evil and deserve to be condemned. But what's so interesting about all of this is, is that again, they're not going into, and we see it in conservative states where they try to do this type of thing in a state like Texas or Florida, the hammer comes down on them. 
But when they're doing this in places where they can get away with it, they're not, they're not attacking conservatives. They're attacking other leftists. In fact, to, well, to case well, in point, well, there's I, a hilarious they're doing both. Um, but yeah. th- there, <laughs> there's a hilarious um uh, tweet that came out recently of young Native Americans arrive at the UCLA liberated zone with a sign saying Hamas supporters aren't welcome on native lands. And then the Hamas supporters physically attack them. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, that gets my point. Yeah, yeah. That drives the point home about yeah. how I don't know well, for they're also there. You can see them fighting themselves even within the protest itself, not just administration versus protesters. It's protester versus protester. They had to take a little pause in uh, Seattle the yeah. other day um, because they realized their crowd wasn't diverse enough. Too many white <laughs> students protesting too many, too many uh, white. against white atrocities, apparently. Yeah. And and so they were like, wait a minute, we can't do the encampment yet because there's too many white students. Yeah, that was awesome. In Seattle. <laughs> so, you know, there's another thing that um, uh, that's been going around lately. This is an incredible tweet here. Um. A, a uh, far left rally in Gaza um, or for Gaza at Georgetown University, um, an extremist with a microphone says there's only one solution, anti-fodder revolution. We must have a revolution so we can have a socialist restructuring or uh, um, uh, um, reconstruction of the United States of America. This right here, this this um, tweet from uh, Andy Nago um, really kind of encapsulates why this is happening. At the end I, of the day, this is not about Gaza. This is not about Israel and Palestine. It, it's about cultural Marxism. The issue is never the issue. The issue is the revolution. And I think, it, you know, it's interesting. There was this um, Columbia had to ban a student because like he went on with a video. It's not like somebody misrepresented, him, but his name was, uh, oh, what is it? Kamani James, a leader of the anti-Israeli protest at Columbia University, seen in January 2024 video in which he said Zionists don't deserve to live. The existence of them and the projects they have built, i.e. Israel, it's all antithetical to peace. So yes, they feel very comfortable, very comfortable calling for those people to die. Be glad, be grateful that I'm not just going out and murdering Zionists, he added, right? So when, when we look at all this, and, and I think this part that, that Christian brought up, it, I, it's what, what is the, there's what they say they want, right? And then there's people like this and other people will say, oh, well, that's, that's just a one-off crazy person. He was one of the leaders of the protest. You don't get to, yeah. you don't get to act like this some dude in his mom's basement, right? This, was that the non-binary guy? I don't Th- know. That's what kind of cracks me up. There was a non-binary one and, and he ended up getting, um, I think, expelled. There's what they say they want, but I think it's logical for most of us to look at this and say, okay, I remember not 20 minutes ago where the left was all about talking about rise in anti-Semitic activity in the United States. And, oh my gosh, this is the right wing and look what's going on. And, 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 you know, Charlottesville is indicative of, or the, the protests that happened in Charlottesville is indicative of the entire right wing and Trump and, and all of this, like, so it wasn't that long ago that, Again, Jewish people find them found themselves on the as, as far as the the leftists are concerned on the right side of the oppressor oppressed dynamic, mm-hmm. um, and and almost immediately after October seventh, I think most people, most reasonable people, would have looked at what happened on October seventh and oh my gosh, this is horrible, this is uh, atrocious. There was there was really one place, one place in American culture where you really actually two places where you actually saw people almost immediately after October 7th going out and, and treating Israel and Israelis and Jews as the bad guys. And there was two places you saw it, members of Congress and college campuses. That's where you saw places within the United States where almost immediately, right? Like people are still dying. People are still, people are still being held hostage. It's like, no, no, no. The real problem here is Israel. The real problem here is the occupation of, of Palestine. And so you got to ask yourself, okay, well, wait a second. How was it that five minutes ago, you know, the left was all warning us about increased, you know, anti-Semitic activity on the right. And this is, this is more of just the right wing fascist in the United States. And Donald Trump's a fascist. And if you voted for him, you're a fascist and, and, and you're a Nazi and, and everything else. To now, left wing campus organizers repeating things that, that quite frankly, um, would make the KKK blush. So what exactly has happened? Not to mention the fact that they're not just saying death to Israel or from the river to the sea, you know, Palestine will be free. 
on some of these places, they're shouting death to America. Bill Mars talked about that. Yeah, they're shouting death to America. It, it's and, and again, where is it taking place? College campuses, educational institutions. And, and at some point, you've got to wonder, okay, what exactly is going on to where at a prestigious university like UVA, University of Virginia, right, which is not known for being one of the most liberal universities um, in the country, anything like that, they actually had a student group there that was publishing out flyers of the Hamas terrorists in the parachutes. Like, we're not even talking about like pro, no, 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 it, they're separating Palestine from Hamas. No, they weren't. They were praising Hamas for what they did. They were making statements like, what did you think decolonization would look like? Of course, of course, they have the right, the oppressed have the right to murder their oppressors. And if those people want to be on occupied land, well, then they're part of the problem and they don't care if they're women and children. Okay, so that's where we're at. And it's, it's not the right coming. It's not us, it's not us mean guys with, with beards and pickup trucks doing this. It's our, it's our highly educated college communities. No, highly indoctrinated. You know, a lot of these people have very little education well, to speak of. They, they, actually, they actually got one that was pretty funny. They were interviewing two women that were at a protest, and they were like, what do, what do you hear protesting? They're like, oh, I'm not really sure. Yeah, I wish I was better educated. Yeah, we all do. <laughs> um, Don't you just love <laughs> democracy? These people vote. <laughs> they well, do. But, but here's, here's the deal. I think the real reason why this is going on has far less to do with Gaza because – Let's face it, if you are, are going to attempt to be an intellectually honest and consistent leftist, which I know those, those, those things are antithetical, but if you're going to make the attempt at it, and you think that Nick Freitas, right, you think, you think I'm a horrible dude, I'm a guy that has a lot of like libertarian sympathies, generally wants people to be left alone, I believe in property rights, free markets, and personal responsibility, right, do, do your thing, but you're responsible for your actions, I'm responsible for mine. If you think that makes me a horrible, evil, dictatorial fascist, have, have, you, have you seen what Hamas does to the LGBTQ community in, in Gaza? Because I'm going to, spoiler alert, no drag queen story hours in libraries in Gaza. That's, that's just not a thing. Turns out that's not a thing. Turns out if you tried to do that in Gaza, all right, there, there wouldn't be a counter protest. You'd be executed. So, as long as we're going to try to make this like little funny attempt at being intellectually honest and consistent, I, I would like the left to explain if this is all just about Gaza, if this is all just about occupied territories, can you please explain to me why you think the one country in the Middle East that actually does go on board with so much of your, your, your stated social objectives, open, inclusive, tolerant, universal suffrage, Minorities can hold positions of power. They can gain wealth and influence within the government. All of that exists within Israel. None of that exists within not only like Gaza, but a lot of other places in the Middle East. T turns out, turns out not a, high, not a lot of high-ranking women of color and, um, or, or, or LGBTQ representation within the Saudi government. Turns out not a lot of Again, high-ranking LGBTQ representation in the Saudi government. So here's my question. If, if all of these things are so important to you, so important to you, like absolutely critical, and any sort of opposition to it whatsoever, and I don't even mean like physical opposition, just agree to disagree, is representation of, of fascism, Nazism, and everything else, how do you explain this? And, and the answer is you can't. You can't. There is no way to logically connect the absolute dedication to LGBTQ rights, okay, and the way that Hamas treats people that are L part of the LGBTQ community. You cannot connect those two things and say this makes sense unless that's not really the issue. Unless the real issue is, is that you have a political ideology and you have certain objectives with those political ideologies and these groups and these issues and these people are useful allies for the accumulation of political power, then all of a sudden this makes sense. These two things, these two things now make sense. So it's the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Kind of. I think to some degree, I think it's, um, it's, it's not that what it is. It's like it's, having alliances that, and then you'll just deal with your differences later. 
what what it is it's it, it's the logical conclusion that the oppressed oppressor dynamic inevitably takes you for example and far be it me to shill my own twitter account but i i tweeted <laughs> okay. something We're last used night to that. Just <laughs> kidding. um i mean th- th- this is true if you think about it and i mean what i said was is that vast swaths of the american left hold all the following views one rape and murder are acceptable forms of resistance to drive out quote colonizers and settlers. two all land belongs to the indigenous natives of that land Three, borders are illegitimate. <laughs> and four, no human is an illegal immigrant. Once you understand they literally believe in both blood and soil and open borders at the same time, everything starts to make sense. And I had a lot of people that were upset at me in the comments. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, you, you had all, th- th- there were a couple people that replied to this and they're like, you're an idiot. And I just searched their Twitter feeds and guess what? It's all anti-male, anti-white, yeah. anti-West tweets. And I actually quote, you know, screenshotted some of those and then quote tweeted those because it, it's the same story every single time. People that read something like this and other people have made this argument, by the way, yeah. I, I'm not coming up with anything new here. Anybody who brings this up, the, the response from the left is outrage and, and denial and yeah. saying this is dumb. This is this is idiotic. Is it, is it incorrect? No, in fact, it's not incorrect because the same people that are complaining about somebody pointing this out are the same people that will go around and celebrate yeah. this type of stuff directed at the right groups of people. Notice how I say the right groups of people, mm-hmm. though. You're allowed to be racist towards whites. You're, about, you're allowed to be sexist towards men. You're allowed to want to tear down the fabric of society, but only in the West. You're not allowed to do those things elsewhere. Yeah. And the reason why is because these people have adopted it, it, so so does this mean that all these people are just just crazy radical you know misandry you know anti-white racist i mean some of them are yeah. but but ultimately what, mo- what most of these people are are not actually racist or sexist what most of these people are are simply marxists yeah and they're manifesting their cultural marxism in a form of anti-white anti-west anti-male bigotry directed at those groups why because they've, they've identified those groups as being oppressors. And so, therefore, we're allowed to say all these terrible, mean things about these groups of people because they're oppressors. And so what's happened is, is that they've now lumped Jewish people into the same category, which is interesting because for a long time, and you brought this up, for a long time, Jewish people were not lumped into the same category as all these other groups of people that are oppressors. But you know what? The revolution doesn't stop when, when you think that it's reached a, a suitable endpoint, this is the problem with leftism. And this is also the reason why we keep losing the fight because people like Bill Maher or Anna Kasparian or, or Brianna Wu is another one that's mm-hmm. been brought up increasingly. She was active in the Gamergate controversy about 10 years ago. Very left-wing progressive activist. She's, she's like run a bunch of like packs and stuff like that on the left. Like been a Bernie bro, well, Bernie gal for a very long time. And she's been tweeting a lot of stuff lately that's been upsetting people on the left because she takes issue with what what's happening on these college campuses yeah she's not going out there saying jews are oppressors and we need to wipe them off the face of the earth and exterminate them out of god you know you know the you know river to the sea type of stuff she's been pushing back against that and she's been utterly destroyed on the internet by her own allies because they've now declared her to be a reactionary Mm -hmm. the problem is is that all these people on the left they don't understand the oppressor oppressed dynamic doesn't end when you think it's reached a suitable endpoint. A good example of this is look at how the left now treats the white working class. They used to be the champion of the white working class because they thought they were the ultimate oppressed yeah. under the, the, the classical interpretation of socialism and Marxism, which is about the, the means of production, right? Well, they're the working class and therefore we on the left need to champion them. And so this was back when the, the Democrats would you know, win elections in a landslide in places like Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. But notice how they don't do that anymore. Notice Mm -hmm. how they actually demonize the white working class. That's part of the reason that they're losing the upper Midwest now or that it's become a swing state because they used to to run up the score with this demographic. And now they're they're the butt of every joke and they're, they're the one group of people that you can ridicule and demonize. Well, it shouldn't be a stretch of the imagination to conclude that what they've done to Again, like blue collar white men that used to work in the Rust Belt, who used to be upheld as as the pinnacle of the oppressed group within the United States, and now they're the oppressors. Well, they're going to do the same thing to Jews. They're mm-hmm. going to do the same thing. They're doing the same thing to old school feminists like mm-hmm. J.K. Rowling. Yeah. What What's happened is is that 
this is ultimately is not actually about anti-Semitism. It's not about Gaza. It's not about Palestine. It's not about Israel. It's not about any of this stuff. The goal, what this is all about is Marxism. It's all about cultural Marxism. It goes back to the tweet from Andy Ngo, right? That it, the goal is not actually an anti-Fada revolution. The goal is a socialist Antifada, revolution. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I agree. I, I don't think, because again, you, you can't, there's no way to make sense of, of a bunch of leftist activists in the United States who think you and I are like the pinnacle of like Nazism, right? Even though like we hate everything about that. Um, and, and so much of what they actually support from a public policy perspective bears a far greater resemblance to what that regime was doing than anything we want. Um, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense that they can hate us with the fury that they do but then look at like an organization like Hamas, right? Or, or a society or a government like Hamas. Let's, let's even, let's even sit and not use terrorist organization because they are the elected government of Gaza. They could look at that elected government doing the things that they're doing and say, no, no, that's fine. We, we are closer in alliance with Hamas. Like the left is closer in alliance with Hamas than someone like me. That is not because that is not because they they share you know positions on LGBTQIA plus whatever. That is because they 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 have a different they have a different political objective. Now again to your point, what makes sense of that? Well, when I when I look at the way that they explain the world, what do I see? I see critical theory. <laughs> what is critical theory rooted in? Critical theory is rooted in a Marxist explanation of society along with Marxist solutions for society, the biggest departure, which we've mentioned several times on the show, when you look at Antonio Gramsci, when you look at uh, Herbert Marcuse, when you look at all these guys, the biggest thing is like, you can't just do it economically. Economics isn't enough. You need culturally shaping institutions. You need to recreate, and Marx understood this as well, you need to create a new socialist man or Marxist man, right? The, 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 men, the people we are right now, the human beings we are right now, doesn't seem to work all that well with socialism. So what's the problem? Well, it's not socialism. It's not Marxism. It's people. We have to either be changed, convinced, or re executed, re -educated, re -educated, or eliminated. Now, if you're going to tell me, oh, that's hyperbolic. <laughs> really? Have you, have you studied anything from the Soviet Union? Have you studied anything from Maoist China? Have you studied anything from North Korea? Well, that wasn't real socialism. Of course not. Of course not. I'm sorry. Point me, point me to the Marxist state that hasn't degraded into mass executions, ostracizing, uh, confiscation, imprisonment in gulags without trials. And when, and when they say, oh, that's not really socialism, but then we see them saying death to America. Yeah. And, you know, like, it's like, oh, should, should we not listen to the words that are coming out of your mouth? What, yeah. what, what this is, is ultimately every single person in this video is a loser. And, and I, I mean this in the sense that somebody once tweeted, and I wish I could bring you know, it up. Okay, can we just say this real quick? You don't mean loser in kind of the, you don't mean loser in the pejorative, like you're a loser. You mean, you mean something different, correct? Well, it depends on the context. <laughs> sometimes, yes. Why can't it some, be both? Some, yeah. Sometimes, yes. These people actually think are losers. If, I'm sorry, if you're going out there cheering for Hamas, you're, you're actually worse than a loser. You're just a lunatic. Mm -hmm. But I, I have no sympathy for people that are making excuses for a bunch of murderous barbarians. I just don't. But here, here's what I mean. Somebody once pointed out, you know, the simplest way to define communism, Marxism is, it's an ideology for losers created by a loser in order to give power to losers. Marx was a loser. Yeah, absolutely. Marx was absolutely a loser no his question. entire life. His ideology is an ideology of being a loser. Yeah. He the was, the he whole was idea is, is that there's winners in society and there's losers in society. And if the losers all get together, they can overthrow the winners and become the new winners by exterminating and killing <laughs> and stealing and pillaging from all of the winners. Somebody actually, um, there, there's a, there's another tweet that ended up becoming a meme a little bit, um, from an account that tweeted a few years ago that Marxism is, is basically when, you know, Losers get together and, and, you know, make it illegal to be a normal person and then, you know, rob, steal and kill from normal people out of petty vengeance and 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 resentment. And there, there's some truth to that. And the same thing applies in a cultural sense. So, again, when Marx envisioned this, he was just thinking in terms of the means of production. Yeah. He was only thinking in terms of materialistic economics uh, means. But there's other ways to define being a loser. So, for example, Hamas are a bunch of losers. Because they adhere to a, a murderous, barbarian, 
you know, barbaric ideology that quite frankly belongs in the seventh century. Mm -hmm. They Hamas's ideology is not how you build a successful civilization. No. It's it's simply well, not. They're not builders. They're they're not builders. They're destroyers. They're, de they're destroyers. And, and it, it these like a lot of these people, these activists and different ones, um, a lot of the woke people. All they know how to do is tear things down. They don't know how to build anything. I've, and so yeah. they want to tear down what others have built, and then they don't know why everything's torn down, and they can't seem to rebuild. But, but here's what I'm going to say on that. Like the, the, the reason why I don't readily accept that is because I, I, I understand that there's something to be said for, I, I, I don't think most people, like if, if we were even to take like a student encampment like this, I don't think the vast majority of the students on there are like, yes, I want to be a, I just want to tear things down. I want to, I want to burn it all to the ground. They honestly believe that they are trying to build something. They are trying to build something. And the problem is, is that something else is standing in the way. So they're And that it thing down. that is standing in the way is one day it's Israel. One day it's me, right? One day it's capitalism. One day it's right. whatever it is, whatever is antithetical or whatever they perceive to be as antithetical to their, the, the, the wonderful, utopian, tolerant, equitable society that they want to build, right, is bad. It's evil. It has to be torn down. You, you, don't build, you don't build a new building on top of an old one. You tear down the old one. And so the reason why I think that's important to understand is because I don't want to, I don't want to give the impression that we're just flippantly dismissing what it is that they're, what, they're, what their objective is. I, I got to push back just a little because... Yeah. They may think they want to build something, but they can't really put it fully into words. And part of the reason why is because they tear down this thing. And then instead of building something in its place, they go to the next thing to go tear down and the next thing to go tear down. And this is why they, they, it's like an entire group of people with terrible ADD. It's like they, all they know how to do is the first part and they can't complete the task, right? They can't go and finish anything. And, and so well, no, building. they're not building anything up. They, they've built up these, uh, they, they take things over. They don't build things up. Well, but this, is, this is the thing that Yuri Bezmanov talked about. He goes, these guys don't last once the, so they, they keep it, we want a socialist revolution. And Yuri Bezmanov was like, you guys won't last two years with once the, once you get what you think you want, you don't last because you're all you're good at is agitating. Yeah. You may think that you're, you, you know, you're really building toward a, a great, wonderful society, but the only thing that you really contributed was agitation, destruction, dismantling, disintegration. And destabilization. Now, destabilization. And now that we don't need that, now that we need the opposite of those things in order to have a functioning society, yeah. you're not useful. In fact, you're worse than not useful. You're a threat. Remember that the, the final phase of active measures is normalization. Yeah. Once you get to the normalization phase, you don't want the agitators anymore because the agitators don't normalize, the agitators destabilize. Yeah. But once the regime is in place, no, you, you liquidate those people. This is what's happened in every single Marxist revolution that's ever taken place. Stalin consolidated the revolution. He put an end to it. How did he do it? By purging the entire party of the Trotskyites. Yeah. They were the agitators. Yeah. Mao did the exact same thing with the Cultural Revolution. Here's the thing we want to get at of this. Like, what is the takeaway for, for the audience, for everyone watching, is that, again, do, do I believe that there's nobody there that is genuinely concerned about civilians in Gaza? No, I, I believe that there's people that are. I believe it's appropriate to be genuinely concerned about noncombatants anywhere. Does, does that mean I think that Israel should immediately do a ceasefire? No. You know what I think? I think Hamas should stop having a policy of butchering and murdering people. Because it ends up being bad, not just for the people you butcher and murder. It ends up being for your bad for your own people, especially when you decide to hide your munitions and your fighters around schools and hospitals, right? There's a reason why. There's a reason why when we look at things like Geneva Conventions and, and rules of warfare, we say don't do that, and it's in order to prevent women and children and noncombatants from being harmed. Hamas does it on purpose because the CNN and the Associated Press will dutifully report anything. Without actually saying, gosh, you know, could there be some connection to a terrorist organization putting military munitions, fighters in, in places that they're not supposed to, and then people getting harmed as a result? And, and maybe, maybe Hamas should bear some of the responsibility for when that happens. Nope, none of that. None of that. And again, it's not because CNN and the AP desperately want to live in the sort of society that Hamas would provide them. Hamas is just useful for the moment. The Palestinian cause is useful for the moment. At some point, it will not be useful. At some point, it will not be useful for them. So, so for anybody that the reason why you're in this is because of, of Palestine, 
please understand that a lot of the people that are getting up there and protesting right now couldn't care less on the big picture. They just couldn't. This is useful. And when it stops being useful, they won't be there anymore. The other thing that I, I want people to understand is that I, 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 and this is the part where conservatives are going to get mad at me. Um, I'm so tired of hearing conservatives say, well, you know, you know what we need is we need to do this or we need to elect people that are going to, I'm sorry, are, are you, did you take out a second mortgage so your kid could go to Columbia? Do you, are you still donating to Columbia? Is that, I'll see that. You'll see conservative business owners donating to their alma mater. Have you, have you been, have you been watching what your alma mater has been creating lately? Right. Well, we, we need to invest more money in higher education. Okay, great. If you want to personally invest in higher education, go do it. But you don't get to take it from my constituents. I've, I've had the representatives from various universities asking for more money from the state budget in Virginia. And my statement back to them is like, I, I am not against higher education as a concept. But I will tell you this, if you're producing a good product, I don't think you should be coming to me and asking me to steal from my constituents to give it to you. If you can't convince my constituents to give you their money, I'm not going to steal it from them on your behalf. And now, good news for them, most, most other legislators will because it's investment in higher education. Or here's the one, we need to keep tuition down. Oh, oh, okay, good. So the more money yeah, there's that no the federal government <laughs> or the state government throws in to higher education, the, the more tuition will go down? Oh, is, has that no. been working out for us? It hasn't? Oh, okay. I wonder why. And, and I, I think more people need to understand something. Let's look real quick at, at how much money is going into these institutions. So, by the way, there's not like one-stop shop that you can go to to figure out how much is being spent on all this. That's, that's not a thing. You will not find that. You're going to have to do some research. I know because I spent a lot of time, you know, trying to find all of this. And the frustrating part was this. When you look at the amount of money that is being spent. And I'm going to start off with this first one, excuse me, where it was just talking about um, the federal dollars. Federal investments, I love that term investment. Just so you know, investment is something you do with your own money. It's not, uh, whatever. Federal investments in universities affected over 3,000 schools, including 17.5 million graduate and undergraduate students. Okay, but my question was, is how much are you spending? The federal government directed 60 pipe, okay, he goes, college and universities receive 1.068 trillion in revenue from federal and non-federal sourcing, so that's federal and non-federal, in 2018. In 2018, they were receiving over a trillion dollars. Higher ed was receiving over a trillion dollars from federal and non-federal funding sources. So that was six okay. years ago. I wonder what it is now. In 2018, federal money made up 14% of all college revenue. About 3.6% of total federal spending went towards higher education investments. And according to the U.S. government's data lab, data lab operates under the Department of Treasury and is public source for federal spending data. Federal grants at universities received 27% of the total investment or $41 billion from the federal government in 2018. Grants are a form of financial assistance given to individuals or organizations to fund research and projects that contribute to the public good, according to Data Lab. I can tell you right now, when you look at the state level, states are also giving in the billions are with they respect to higher education. Now, um, there was an article here I'm trying to are find Are they including uh, the numbers of student loans that are... Yeah. Given out by the federal government? Yeah. So here's, here's the top 20 universities. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just going to mention some of them. that get federal spending. So Yale University came in at number 20 with $480 million. Yale, as of 2016, had an endow endowment of $25.4 billion. Right? So, yeah. Then you have University of uh, Minnesota, $505 million. Um, University of Colorado, 535 million. University of California, San Francisco, 535 million. They sit on top of an endowment of 1.1 billion. Harvard University received 550 million. They have an endowment of, I think now their endowment's up around $50 billion. That's the endowment for Harvard. Uh, University of Wisconsin, Madison, 551 million. Now, again, some of this is to fund research. Okay. Some, so some of it is not just direct expense. I want to be intellectually honest here. Some of this is not just direct subsidization to a university. A lot of it is in the form of grants or it's in research projects, capital projects. Georgia so Institute is this, are these some of the organizations, like is this where we fund things like giving cocaine to pigeons and, yeah, and things of, of that nature? 
Yeah. Okay. Some of it. So there, there's some of your studies. Yeah. Yeah. Duke University, 562 million. University of Pittsburgh, 580 million. Uh, Penn State, 599.8 million. Um, University of, let me see here. University of California, San Diego, 643 million. Now, keep in mind, this is just what the feds are doing. This is just what the federal government's doing. Right. The states, I, I want to say, I think the state funds somewhere. Berkeley likes to say, oh, well, the state of California, even though we're a public institution, the state of California only funds about like 14% of our overall budget. Okay, but from what I understand, that equates out to somewhere around $400 million. So keep in mind, this is not, this is not your child went to Berkeley and your child or you are paying tuition to Berkeley in exchange for an education. This is the state of California taking your money and giving it to Berkeley. Right? Same thing here in Virginia. We give hundreds of millions of dollars to universities sitting on endowments worth billions, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. We actually give billions. I've got the chart pulled up right here. Virginia gives uh, well over $8 billion, almost $9 billion. This is in 2021. It's probably yeah. over $9 billion Oh, it's going now. higher this year. It's going higher this year. So let, let's do, let's do, I want to look at something real quick. Just, just interesting, right? So we're giving all this money. So understand higher educate, the government is investing in higher education. So you have over a trillion dollars going into institutions of higher education. Um, hundreds of millions from the fed or hundreds of billions from the fed, uh, hundreds of billions from, from individual States. Uh, let's look at the university of California voting, uh, habits or the, or the, uh, campaign donation habits. So this is, this represents the entirety of the university of California system. So I'm not just cherry picking Cal Berkeley, right? I'm not just cherry picking, you know, one, one institution that we all know is the university of San Francisco. Nope. It's the average for all of them. Okay. So let's go, let's look at 2024 cycle, 2024 cycle. And let's see what percentage for all federal candidates, 94.78% of all donations went to Democrats. 5.22% went to Republicans. Okay. That, man, it's, it's, it's California though, right? That's California. California. We all know that California is a little bit kooky. Let's go to Columbia where a lot of this, where a lot of this stuff is happening right now. Columbia is actually, I think a, a, a nonprofit. It's a private university. Let's see what were, what were the donations from the faculty and staff at Columbia where, where kids are going to get a well balanced education from multiple perspectives. Cause we all know diversity of thought is very important. And this is an Ivy education. league. All right. Okay. So, oh, 95.7%, 95.7% went to Democrats, 4.23% to Republicans. So Columbia, based off of their campaign contributions, more left wing than the University of California system. Okay. What about Yale? I mean, Yale's, Yale's got to be different, right? Yale's, you know, it's, of course they're, they're going to have a little bit more diversity, right? I was actually watching some comments for students that were saying, you know, I'm a little bit more conservative. If I go to Yale, am I going to, Oh no, no, no. We're, we're very open. We're very tolerant. We like diversity of thought. Okay. All federal candidates, 96.6% of all campaign donations in 2024 to Democrats. Okay. Let's look at another one here. Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Okay. Now we're talking of, now we're talking about a school that you're probably, it's probably not on the top of your list. If you're looking for a liberal arts degree, right? You're probably going for some of the hard sciences. You're going for engineering, right? You're going for something of that nature. So clearly they're going to be, they're, they're going to be, you know, more balanced. Maybe we're around the, maybe we were like 60, 40, maybe 55, 45 Republican. Nope. 84%. And that right there, ladies and gentlemen, is about as conservative as you're going to get from any institution that is not blatantly conservative, right? Liberty will give you better numbers. Hillsdale will give you better numbers. But no, that, that's about the best you can hope for right there. For one that isn't like explicitly conservative. For one that isn't explicitly conservative. Because so that, that, MIT that, by nature is going to be more conservative because it's not dealing with liberal arts and the humanities, which tend to have been, I mean, they've, th those, those fields have been totally overrun by cultural Marxists at this point. And, and that, that really drives home the point about what exactly is the problem here? And also what the opportunity is, because if you think about it, and Tina, you were hinting at this earlier, and I, I really want to have a more detailed conversation about this, because remember when, when we were talking about how, like, it's not conservatives that these people are, are screeching to about globalized the uh, um, Antifada. Antifada, right, and how we need a socialist revolution in the United States. It's on the university campuses where they're doing this, and they're screeching this to professors, and they're screeching it to the board and, and other students. In fact, here's a statement that Columbia put out this morning. 
uh, just like basically like an hour or two ago. And this is really interesting where they said that, you know, they were in talks. They tried to negotiate with the students who have set up an encampment on the, uh, the campus grounds and um, how they're violating a lot of school policies. And they said, we've tried to give you spaces and times for you to demonstrate, you know, legally and without disrupting things like the graduation that's supposed to be taking place pretty soon and without disrupting the classes that are supposed to be taking place. And they even offered a bunch of concessions. They said that, you know, we've been working to, you know, do all these these different things that that you say that you care about when it comes to Gaza. But we refuse to divest from Israel. We refuse to join the, you know, BDS, the boycott, mm -hmm. divestment and sanctions um, movement. And we want you to remove the encampments. Can we can we find some some middle ground here? And the students basically told them to go take a hike. And so Columbia put out this statement basically saying that, you know, our negotiations kind of fell through. So what's fascinating about all of this is that the, the, it, 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 two things are true. First off, it is abundantly true that the universities have been completely hijacked by left-wing ideologues. Like, and I don't mean liberal ideologues. I mean left-wing cultural Marxist ideologues. These are not your old-school liberals. Let's get along to go along. I, I'll defend your freedom of speech. These are hardcore indoctrinated ideologues that have a set agenda that they want to impose on society. And how do they impose it on society? By educating the vanguard that will actually carry out the cultural Marxist revolution. But what's fascinating is, is that this same vanguard that they've been educating have now been sicked not on red state America or conservatives. They've been sicked on the institutions themselves. Mm -hmm. They've created a monster. And now, Frankenstein is fighting his own monster. By the way, a lot of people forget this. Frankenstein is actually the doctor. Doctor. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. not the monster. Um, so, so Dr. Frankenstein is now fighting his own monster that he's created. And so what's so fascinating about all this is that we are, are, are not, we're not used to seeing the Leviathan fighting itself. We're not used to seeing, again, the, the board at Disney, the, right, you know, the writers of the New York Times and the, and the, um, the faculty at Berkeley or Columbia or any of these universities deviate from each other. They're always in lockstep and they're always pushing the same agenda, all of them, just from different angles. But right now what we're seeing is, is that the activist class that's, that's coming out, that's being churned out of these universities are now attacking the universities themselves. Yeah. And so honestly, one thing that conservatives need to do is look, if you're breaking the law, if, if these mobs of protesters are going out there and, you know, they're leaving the campus and they're, you know, attacking small businesses or, or you know, people's homes and stuff like that, if they're, if they're engaging in violence, yes, bring in the National Guard, the police, arrest them and do all that stuff. But you know what? If they're delegitimizing the universities, if they're destroying the universities, I say let them do it. I say stand back and let them burn Columbia to the ground. And the reason why is because Columbia is not your friend. If you're listening to this podcast and you're even remotely on the right, Columbia is your enemy. And do not interrupt an enemy when they are making a mistake. The enemy is currently fighting itself. And we should be sitting back and eating popcorn and watching the left-wing Leviathan, the culturally shaping institutions that they have hijacked, we should let them burn themselves to the ground because the goal of a conservative nowadays should not be to save these institutions. There is no saving Berkeley any more than they're saving Columbia. No, you should be dismantling Berkeley and Columbia because Berkeley and Columbia are churning out cultural Marxists. They're churning out useless, useful idiots whose only purpose in life is to help facilitate a left-wing socialist takeover of, of every single aspect of the country that they can possibly get their hands on. They would turn this country into the Soviet Union if they had the ability to do so, but they don't have the ability to do so. And right now, they're not fighting us. They're fighting the very institutions that created them. I say let them, let them at it. I, well, the left will cower to them. The, what, what will happen, because the left always cowers, cowers to birth, they will cower to those who are further left than them. And what's happening here, I believe, is they are attempting to shift the Overton window within their own side and so when you have infighting they are fighting to shift it their direction or or keep it their direction and so they're not going to get more conservative what's going to happen is they're going to find common ground somewhere in between this absolute crazy and 
your regular leftists and then your crazy leftists, and then they'll find common ground. So what happened? You moved further to the left, right? Well, that that's the that's the what they call the again the Hegelian dialectic. It's the the thesis, the antithesis, and the synthesis. And that's just a that's just a fancy way of saying here's one side of the issue, here's the other side of the issue, right? They're going to negotiate. So the universities the university side is can you please not burn down the university? Right? The protester side is we want everything. So what, what's going to end up happening is the synthesis, the agreement, the compromise between these two things is the protesters are going to get more than what they had when they started. The university is going to get less than what they had when they started. And then what will instantly happen is that will be the new norm. That will be the new norm. And then these guys, like the, the leftists, they will go even farther to the left. And the next compromise will do the same thing. Every single compromise, it is, it is this way by design. And this is the thing that conservatives don't understand. Like, oh, no, we dealt with this issue. Remember our compromise? No, no, no. The only thing the compromise is, is restarting the starting point. Yeah. That's, Enough's that's never enough. That's, that's, why, um, that's why, like on the issue of, of reparations, you will hear people say like, reparations are not crazy. It's a good first step. And whoa, whoa, whoa. First step? First step, right? Forcing millions of people who never owned, who never participated in slavery to give millions of billions of dollars to people who were never slaves. That's a good first step in addressing slavery. What was it? I'm sorry. Could we at least say that the emancipation proclamation might've been a good first step? No, no. Because any compromise that is, is reached, and again, I'm not comparing slavery with this, right? What I'm saying is, is that this is the sort of attitude that the left uses with, the, again, the Hegelian dialectic. Every compromise you give them simply becomes the new starting point from which they will pull you further to the left. And the question is, well, where, where does it end? Usually in death and destruction <laughs> um, that, until, it, until it's beat. But I, I want to point something out for anybody that thinks that we're being hyperbolic. Because if you want to look at who wrote the who wrote a lot of the when it comes to the student activism piece, right? So when we talk about Marxism, obviously you have Karl Karl Marx, you have Friedrich Engels, you have uh, or Friedrich Engels, you have a lot of other influential authors with respect to the theory of of communism. When it comes to things like cultural Marxism, even though he didn't coin the phrase, he essentially talked about that's Antonio Gramsci, right? When you talk about critical theory and then things like critical critical theory, Herbert Marcuse, the Frankfurt School, you have all these different things that we're we're throwing around. But when it comes to student activism and community organizing, right? The, the, the godfather of that in the United States has got to be Saul Alinsky. And Saul Alinsky wrote the book Rules for Radicals. I think it was 13 rules, if I remember correctly, on how to engage in effective activism. And again, Alinsky was a leftist. But, and, and by the way, in, in the original copy of uh, Rules for Radicals, he actually dedicated it to Lucifer. And, and that's not that's not by accident. You're actually seeing more and more of that kind of come out in these, these leftist circles of, of literally upholding Satan as the first rebel that insisted upon knowledge and you know everything else. And that's, that's what Alinsky did in his first dedication. Is, oh, is, there's even a children's uh, movie or series coming out about poor Satan and, and how he was so oppressed by God. Yeah. So, and See, it's Satan's, for kids. Satan's, it's for now kids. The, Satan's is now the part of the oppressed yes. class, right? All right, so here's this quote from Rules for Radicals that Saul Alinsky wrote. Again, I, I cannot tell you how many of these student activist groups follow the Rules for Radicals, and here's what he said. I have on occasion remarked that I feel confident that I could persuade a millionaire on a Friday to subsidize a revolution for Saturday, out of which he would make a huge profit on Sunday, even though he was certain to be executed on Monday. Right, that's... That's not me putting word in good old Saul's mouth, right? That this is what he said. Now you look at these institutions of higher education, you look at these corporations, you look at these businesses, and what do you see being done? You see them engaging in whether it be ESG programs or DEI programs or, or any number of other programs, studies, courses, or whatnot that are all designed around left-wing ideology, right? Gender studies is not a course on hey, how do we do a better job of understanding, or women's studies is not about how do we do a better job of understanding women's role in history and society. That's not what it's about. If you go into any, pretty much any women's studies program, it's going to be rooted in this idea of the oppressor-oppressed dynamic 
and, and utilizing government and leftist political ideology in order to achieve certain end states. Yeah, it may say women's studies, but that's not a politically neutral course you're taking. I don't think anybody thinks it is. So the, the point of what Saul Alinsky is saying here is that he didn't see, even though he wanted to take this down, he also saw the value that could be had in utilizing it for his own advantages and his own purposes. So when you have BlackRock saying, well, if you want to actually take your company to the next level, you're going to need capital investment. And the only way you're going to get it is if you adopt ESG programs. Well, that company is going to look at it going, well, we need to be able to expand. We need more. We need to be able to hire more. We need to be able to build more infrastructure. I need to get this loan from Bank of America or BlackRock or whoever else it might be. So, okay, I'll adopt the thing. I'll adopt the thing you're telling me I've got to do in order to make the profit now, even though eventually down the road. Now, they never think that down the road that's actually going to happen. They don't think they're going to be killed by the revolution. They don't think that. I think this is just, this is just something we got to put up with, something we got to endure. It's just the times we live in now. Well, the times we live in now are moving more and more to the extreme. Now, here's something, here's an article that I found that I thought was actually somewhat encouraging. And that was one that says, <clears throat> survey finds employer conf, or excuse me, not that one. Where was it? Here we go. Survey results also indicate, so basically what this, what this overall article from eCampus News is saying is that many employers say they won't hire Gen Z grads. Now, this wasn't just focused on Gen Z, all right? There was, it was actually focused on new college graduates, which just happened to be Gen Z grads. So this was less about Gen Z than it was the university system. According to survey results from Intelligent.com, a resource for online degree rankings and higher education planning, 40% of business leaders say recent college graduates are very or somewhat unprepared for the workforce. Among this group, 70% say recent college graduates lack preparedness due to their work ethics. 70% say communication skills. 71% say entitlement. And 43% say technological skills. How in the actual hell does a modern Gen Z grad lack technological skills by comparison. But you notice that seven, the biggest one there, 71% say entitlement. The, the entitlement is not, look, it is, it is very, very popular for one generation to say to a younger generation, well, back when I was your age or, you know, kids these days, what, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about college graduates. So we're talking about business owners, people that are going to hire other people saying I got a real problem hiring college grads, young college grads, because 71% of them come in with a sense of entitlement. Where'd they learn that entitlement? You could say from parents, but they've, they're definitely learning it from a university system which treats students who leave class in order to go protest and set up an encampment, right? So we're, we're missing classes to set up an encampment to make demands about a conflict that's going on in Gaza. And with, with every expectation that the university is going to capitulate, that there will be no consequences for their actions. And then that same person shows up into the workforce and guess what happens when they show up? They have the same expectations. I'm going to get whatever I want. I'm fighting for cosmic justice. Your business exists in order to make, in order to assist me in that process by providing me a paycheck that I am owed and I deserve. And the moment you don't do what I want, I'm going to go after you. I'm going to occupy your offices. We saw that at Google. I'm going to demand things from you. And if you don't give them, I'm going to rally support around behind me. I'm going to try to hurt your company and its brand. Why would you hire that person? This is why I say burn it to the ground. Burn the university system to the ground. Here's the, and, and you know, it's really sad that we've gotten to this point, but let's be honest. Universities do not have a monopoly on knowledge. Or the, no, or, or, the less or so inquiry. now than at any time in human history. Less so now in any time in human history do, you, do universities have a monopoly on, on... If we executed the meme, right, that I showed you earlier, the tanks in Harvard Yard, if we bulldozed Harvard to the ground, not that we would, right, but, like, if we bulldozed Harvard to the ground... <laughs> I do not associate myself with those comments. <laughs> ...insulted the earth, Roman style, right? If, 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 if we went full Cato, you know, Harvard Delonda Est... Um, <laughs> No knowledge would be lost. Actually, no, that's not entirely true. Knowledge of cultural Marxism might be lost. <laughs> but, I mean, I view that as, a, as an absolute win. I, 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 again, the thing that, that, that conservatives need to get across, and, and look, I, I, I get that you might not be taking the, the as extreme position as me about how, like, we need the tanks in Harvard Yard. 
I, I get that. But I do think that we're on the same page when it comes to the idea that we both know that the university system has been hijacked by left-wing activists. These are not rational people. These are not moderates. These are not liberals even. They are, they are radical left-wing activists that have taken over the university system from presidents. We saw what, what President Gay said at Harvard right before mm -hmm. she got ousted for plagiarism, mm -hmm. right? Like these people, again, are our ideological opposites in almost every single respect. They've hijacked the university systems. And what have they done? They haven't turned the university systems into, oh, even, you know, greater bastions of knowledge and, mm -hmm. and churning out enlightened students that are ready to, you know, lead the United States well into the 21st century. Like, no, they've turned out a bunch of activists that apparently don't know how to hold a job, but they do know how to hold a protest. And so when I say things like burn the university system to the ground, the reason that I say this is because I don't think that there's much that would actually be lost if you shut down Columbia or you shut down Harvard. Now, there might be some prestige and some nostalgia that would be lost. And yes, that is, it's very sad that these ancient institutions have been hijacked by the left, but there's no saving Berkeley well, any more than they're saving Columbia. I don't, this is why I don't like the idea of burn it down. I'm not trying to adopt the other side's philosophy with respect to, you know, people I disagree with, but here's what I will say. You don't need to burn it down. How about this? How about stop giving them other people's money? If you are so damn good at what you do, Columbia University, well, then go out there and do it and ask people to donate or attend courses or to pay for research without relying on the government first confiscating it from other people in order to give it to you. If you're so damn good at what you do, then go out there and prove it. But no, that's not what happens. I get to sit there and listen to smug people explain to me about how this is really necessary because studies have shown, like, I'm done. I'm done with your studies because half the time you guys are the ones conducting them. Right. It, it's always amazing how when you ask the private sector about universities, you get a much different response than when you ask the universities about the universities. So, no, just stop funding them. Just stop. And, and that, that's not we're not being mean. We're not being mean. We're not taking anything away from them that they're owed. They're not. I'm sorry. The, the university system is not owed anything from taxpayers. Right. Any more than McDonald's is owed anything from taxpayers. Anything more than General Motors is owed anything from taxpayers. But a big problem that we have is the more power that you give to politicians to be able to hand out other people's money, the more they will do so in association with their interests. And if you're a Democrat, of course you want to give as much money to these institutions as humanly possible. They're, they're creating your future voters. They're creating the future HR departments, which are going to gatekeep which are going to create the sort of environments where if companies don't prioritize stuff that has nothing to do with the actual provision of goods and services, it has everything to do with left-wing motivated activism, they're going to suffer as a result. They're going to face lawsuits. They're going to face new legislation. If you're a Democrat, it makes perfect sense why you're pouring over a trillion dollars a year between state and federal funds into these universities. They are your ideological allies. There is no equivalent on the right. There is no equivalent on the right. You want to know how much money, you want to know how much money the state of Virginia gave to, oh, I don't know, gun groups in Virginia. Gun groups with ideologically or more aligned with the right. You want to know how much money we get? Zero. We don't give many. You want to know how much money I lobbied to give to them? Zero. Because we shouldn't be doing that. Because they shouldn't be taking your money to give it to something that is not directly aligned with what legitimate functions of government are. But the left does not see it that way. The left sees a huge pile of money and thinks to themselves, how do we get this to as many of our friends as possible? And let me give you a perfect example. For the same Democrats that sat there and lectured me in Virginia, like, we're doing this to keep tuition down. UVA spends $20 million a year on DEI hires. So they have a DEI board, $20 million a year. Those are, now is that $20 million in the form of all these, these wonderful, you know, policies that are, that are helping with inclusion and, and, and bringing more people? No, 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 no. They're, they're paying people hundreds of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands. Of, open the books fund, UVA Global's chief diversity offer, Martin Davidson receives nearly $600,000 per year in salary and benefits, 600 grand per year to be the chief diversity officer for UVA. Do you, you want to know what $20 million represents at, at UVA? You could give just about the entire student body $1,000 off their tuition. 
There's about 21,000 students at, at UVA, 20, 20 to 22, right? You take $20 million, you divide that by that, about $1,000 per student. You give them all $1,000 off their tuition. Would that be helpful? Yeah, I, b- I bet it would. You want to know what they're going to do instead? They're going to lobby the federal government to take your money, give it to that student in the form as a loan, then send that kid through a bunch of classes so that when they show up at back at home, because by the way, you also are helping to pay for their, their, their college, right? When they show up back at home for Thanksgiving, they're going to lecture you on what a horrible white supremacist colonizing bigot you are. Then they're going to go back to that university in order to get this degree, which may or may not be valuable. It depends. If we're going into a hard science, it could be very valuable. If they're going into medical school, it could be very valuable. If they're going to one of these groups that has studies in the title, probably not. Probably going to be needing their, their college loan forgiven. Oh, great. So, so that's what's going to happen, right? The university is going to prioritize their own spending, and they're going to say, look, guys, it, it sure would be nice to spend $20 million a year on DEI staff. It sure would be nice to be able to spend $600,000 a year on the chief diversity officer for UVA because I'm sure he's generating over $600,000 worth of value for the university. But we just can't do it. We can't do it. We got all these students that are struggling right now. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take this funding over here, right? And we're going to forgive some of the college loans for people that went to our university and didn't get a viable degree. Or or we're going to take some of this money and we're going to give our students a a, a drop in tuition, right? We're going to drop in tuition in in order, in order to help with this. We're going to, we're going to prioritize this over here because like we've said, that's really important to our university. Are they going to do that? No, they're going to show up in my office saying we need more money to invest in higher education in order to keep tuition down. Ladies and gentlemen, how arrogant, how arrogant do you have to be to essentially show up and tell people, hey, we're turning your kid into an activist and we're probably turning your kid into someone that is not going to like you very much. And maybe if you're lucky, they'll get an economically viable degree depending on what sort of course of study they take. And, that, and, that, and we're going to get our cut as the university because we're smart and we're wise and we're, and we're essential to the economic and social future of the country. We're going to get our cut from the federal government, from the tuition, from the loans, from the state funds, which all means from you. We're going to get our cut from you. And then if we produce a good product, yay, that's excellent. I guess we delivered on our promise. But if we produce a bad product, well... You're going to have to pay for that. Not us, because again, we're wise and smart. We're, we're higher education. Don't you understand how important we all are? Don't you? And you know what? You don't. And that's why the government needs to give us your money, because you clearly don't possess the intellectual capacity to understand just how critical we are to society. I mean, I know you're out there doing your cute little job, whether it's being a, you know, a plumber or an HVAC tech, or maybe an electrician, or maybe running your small business. You know, and that's that's adorable. We love it. We appreciate the the tax funds, but they should be ours anyways because we're smarter than you. Uh, but this is how it's going to work, right? And if and if you don't appreciate that, well, again, it's probably because you don't possess the necessary intelligence. You just don't understand. Maybe you should take some some college courses. They'll be really expensive, but uh, we'd be happy to educate you. But in the meantime. We're not going to convince you to give us your money in the form of tuition. We're going to take it from you. To our friends over here, the elected officials. And if you don't like it, tough. That's what's going on in this country right now. And nobody gets to tell me it's not because I've seen it from the inside. That's what's going on. That's effectively what is taking place. So here's my question. Do you want to contribute to that? I know there's some part, I know there's some you can't, but if you're not calling up your state legislator or your, your congressman and saying, no, I don't consider, if you vote for this, I do not consider that an investment in the future. I do not consider that an investment in education. I consider it you stealing it and giving it to your ideological allies. That's how I will interpret that vote. Well, then don't be surprised when they do more of this. Right. Nick. If you're going to, and then if you're going to voluntarily contribute by saying, you know what, gosh, I want my child to go to that alma mater. Why? Well, 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 the credentialing, well, more and more business owners are actually removing the requirements to get a bachelor's degree. It's something like 50% are, are removing the bachelor's degree requirement. 
we have we are out there right now looking for people to hire what we do here. And I'm going to tell you, if I'm being perfectly honest, depending on where you got the degree, it is not helping you. It is hurting you. It, at this point, if you got your degree from one of these institutions, I probably don't want you anywhere near me. I don't want you anywhere near the work that we're doing. I don't want you anywhere near the company. I don't want you anywhere near these people that I care about because we're trying to do something and we're trying to create something. We're trying to build something and you don't know how to do that. You know how to tear things down and you know how to complain. Great. Good luck finding a job for that, but it ain't going to be here. And so more and more people need to understand whatever you currently think of in your head with respect to higher education or the good time you had going through school. And let's go ahead and do it all the caveats that, yes, you can still get a quality education at certain institutions and in certain degree programs. Absolutely. There's also some jobs where you have to get the degree. By the way, we should probably point out that that is also, that is also in many cases, a complete cronyist fix between government and universities. For, for the government to come out and say, oh, you have to have this sort of credential. Oh, well, well who offers it? Oh, higher education. Our that's body's a, over here. That's another way for them to support their ideological enemies at your expense. You're not allowed to provide goods and services within these categories unless you go give your money over here to the people. So no, we're not taking the money from you. No, no. We're just saying that the opportunities that you have for your life, right, have been reduced significantly until you give our friends money. And about a quarter of the classes that you have to take over there have nothing to do with your degree. They literally just exist to keep professor, professors employed. No, right. no, 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 no. That, that's not the only reason. They also exist to indoctrinate you. Well, oh, I, I, too. I sat there and listened. I sat there and listened to a colleague of mine in the General Assembly. Like, education is so much more about just reading, writing, arithmetic. It's about, it, it's about creating social cohesion. Like, oh, yes, according to you, right? right? It's your version of what social cohesion is. It's your version of what it means to be a good citizen. No, I completely agree that that is exactly what you think education is for. In fact, I would argue you think education has far less to do with reading, writing, and arithmetic and far more to do with the sort of social engineering that you would like. So yes, I agree. I agree that that is what you see it for. But the good news is, is industry at some point is starting to recognize for some of these students based off of what the degree is and what it's, so where did you get the degree? What was it in and what did you do when you were at college? That, that all of a sudden, this whole idea that I show up and I've got a degree from wherever and that is an automatic ticket into that interview. That's an automatic ticket into that first job. That's an automatic ticket with that network. Nope, that's starting to go away and it can't happen soon enough. This is, this is what I meant when I said burn it down. So I, I might've used more incendiary rhetoric, no pun intended, actually <laughs> pun totally intended. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> We're on the same page there because yeah. what, what you were just saying, you know, five minutes ago, which by the way, that was a brilliant assessment on what the current situation is. You were spot on. If, if we simply stopped giving them credibility, this goes back to our, our discussion about retaking, you know, the reconquest of American culture. By the way, if you have not watched that episode, I highly recommend that you go and as soon as you're done with this podcast, go and watch that podcast. That was the title, The Reconquest of American Culture. We talked a little bit about this. Part of the reason that these culturally shaping institutions that the left has hijacked have the, the amount of influence that they have is because we grant it to them mm -hmm. and we subsidize them. Some cases through the use of force and coercion by government, many cases through the use of force and coercion by government. If we stopped doing that, if we as conservatives stopped giving them our money and lending them our credibility, guess what? It would burn itself to the ground. We wouldn't have to do anything. These people would destroy themselves. And that's what I meant when I say burn it to the ground. What I mean is we on the right need to stop trying to prop up a failing system. Here's a bit of good advice. Generally, it's, it's, it's considered good advice to try to distance and separate yourself from that which is inevitably going to collapse. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, I, I, I think I, I know through. I know we get a little bit heated. I get heated on this topic because I find it so frustrating. Um, and, and part of it is it's the arrogance. It, it's the arrogance that we get hit with that just really, um, really just makes me furious sometimes because I, I see people that go out there and work incredibly hard. I, I see people that go out there and work incredibly hard under very difficult circumstances, running a business or taking care of their family or, or whatever it is. 
get treated as if um, they're somehow intellectually or even morally inferior because they, they don't have a degree from one of these esteemed institutions. And it is, it's, it's insulting. It, it's truly insulting, especially when you look at the sort of product that is increasingly being created at these universities. So here's what I'm going to say. As much as I got a little bit heated on this one, um, I'm actually encouraged to see that more and more industries are, are waking up to the idea. And it's not because I want all the university system to burn down. I don't actually. I don't want it to burn down. I want it to reform. And a lot of times the most important, the most important factor to leading toward genuine reform is pain. They're going to have to feel the pain of what happens when you turn what should be an institution of higher education, one of diverse thought, opinion, research, study, critical analysis, critical thinking. When you turn that into an activist mill, you deserve to feel pain from that. You just do. And you certainly don't deserve the sort of public subsidization that you're getting. I think that's actually true of all times. Again, you want to provide a quality education? Then do such a good job of it. Make your degree so economically viable, not because you've manipulated things with the government or licensing laws or anything like that. Do it because when somebody leaves your institution, they are fully equipped to go in to a world as an entrepreneur, as an employee, as an inventor, as an innovator, as a thinker, whatever it is, and dominate. But I don't see a whole lot of that happening compared to more and more of this. Student encampments, making demands, and insisting on leftist ideology. All right. Well, we hope you found this informative. I um, want to, once again, do a shout out to uh, Good Ranchers. Go to GoodRanchers.com. Put in promo code Nick. You're going to lock into that price shielding. So, again, don't, don't, don't waste your money on an academic institution that hates you. Right, spend it on an institution that is going to give you excellent meat delivered right to your door, and will lock you in at the same price now all the way through 2026. That's that's pretty incredible, right? So once again, thank you very much for joining us. We hope you found this interesting, entertaining, and informative, and we will see you next episode.